Okay, so we've got two more sessions, and then we're going to have a, a, a drinks and a networking break. Um, the, uh, so this, this is, um, where are we? Growth, aren't we? Me uh, meaningful growth uh, in, in, the, uh, in the social age. What does that mean? That's what we're going to find out. Um, so I, I guess one of the, the themes over this year has been a shift uh, in emphasis for publishers. I mean, it's a long-term shift. Away from counting clicks and boasting about like clicks, um, you know, that, that big traffic number, to thinking more deeply about what an engaged audience looks like uh, and how we can sort of make money from that engaged audience. Um, we've also seen a big shift with the social media platforms, at the same time growing importance as a source of news for people, um, while at the same time sending less traffic our way as publishers, which creates a little bit of a conundrum for us. So that's what we're going to grapple with. Uh, we have joining us uh, Matt Payton, who's the head of audience at The Independent. Hi, Matt. Uh, we've got Anna Jays, who's the audience and content director for new audiences, Reach PLC, is that fair? Yeah. Hi, Anna. Hi. Uh, we have Mickey King, who's the president of ArcXP. Hi, Mickey. Welcome. Uh, we know, we've heard about ArcXP. And we have Tim Pearson on my right, Tim, who is the chief revenue officer for the Lab Bible Group. Welcome, Tim. Morning. Good Welcome. morning. So first up, uh, let's dive in and talk, talk about that question I touched on in the intro there. Um, are we still in the social age, the social media age? Um, and how important is social media for publishers, given, um, as uh, John Steinberg said in the first session, there's, there's very little direct revenue now coming to publishers from the social platforms. And, um, and what can we do, given the very fickle behaviour of these platforms when it comes to their media partners? And we saw an example of that yesterday with Facebook, which pulled the plug on millions of pounds of funding for publishers when it said it's killing off its uh, Facebook news tab. And it also uh, withdrew funding for 100 reporters, which it published. So they sort of give if and they take away these platforms. Uh, Tim, do you, would you like to lead off on this one? Yeah. Very much in the gold stage. I'll just check. Can everyone hear? Can everyone hear, Tim? Okay. Oh, that's better. Yeah. I need to do Yeah. Yeah, I think we're still very much in the, in the gold age. We need to show that the increased time spent on social is significant, particularly if you look at Gen Z audience. I think, according to our research, we're spending about like four hours per day now on social media and that will only grow over time as a lot of more audience. But more than just the scale, there's also the importance that social media is playing in the roles of the lives of young adults beyond inspiration, information. It's now the number one uh, many people, the number one uh, search engine as well. Uh, you see the ambitions for for MSI, Elon and Meta. Uh, so it's, it's crucially important for life, particularly with young adults. Um, even the creators of economy now have thrived in social media. $16 billion economy last year, we took on $4 billion this year. So a huge reward. Uh, and therefore will remain important, I think, for publishers. We have that in the as well, uh, in terms of being where the audience is. We have to be where the audience is and communicate to the audience in ways that it's made and authentic to them. It's where we find new audiences and new communities. It's where we build brands. Uh, and that's obviously very much where we monetize. Um, we have an indirect and direct monetization as well. Um, and all that's growth. And actually, the traffic that's coming from social in our websites. Um, it's increases as well. So we're, we're seeing traffic in those are monetizing as well, which is really good to see. Okay. So it, it presents the challenges though. The, the social media platform is a real pace 
So the, the, the next sort of stage inside the business is really needs to see the FIT and uh, move and see the changes of the algorithms. Um, and that, I, I think, doesn't set a challenge for the business opportunities. Okay. And, and your revenue uh, from that would be mainly mainly native, that fair? So it's sort of uh, having campaigns which run on, on social for partners. Yes, yeah, so we, so we have indirect red share with yeah. the platform and then direct, um, which could be around okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Mickey, would you like to weigh in on this one? Well, I certainly agree with Tim that we are very much in the social age, and I, I don't see that decreasing. I think that for legacy publishers, many of those that we work with, uh, the Washington Post, of course, I think the strategy really has to be about both and. Uh, I think that many legacy publishers are still struggling with uh, the monetization piece on social that we still are sort of helping, working to help them crack the code on. So I think it's important to really understand the value of social, particularly with, with respect to um, branding and really um, it, making sure that there's a footprint there so that you're driving that traffic again back to the site. Um, and I think that from a branding standpoint, we cannot underestimate the value of the social platforms. Uh, I think to be absent from the social platforms is really a detriment, um, particularly when we think about legacy publisher, publishers, many of whom we work with, who are working to build a younger audience and to build um, more sort of engagement um, around uh, audiences that look very different today than they may have looked for their organizations 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So very much still, still there, but I think that we have to think about the strategy as being both and as we work to figure out what monetization looks like on these platforms. Okay. Yeah, the branding piece, important. Yeah, thanks, Mickey. Um, uh, yeah, Matt, how's, how have things changed at the independent then when it, when it comes to your approach to social, given the, the way things have changed with Facebook and Twitter and so on? I think um, I, I, left, I left the Indie a few years ago and have come back. And I think the thing that I would find is the 20 teens were these easy, easy years looking back. And I think the two previous speakers said exactly right, that this, it, we're even more of a social age, but we have to play their game. It can't just be we throw things at a wall and things are going to stick. And also the frustrations that everyone feels with the likes of Facebook, the likes of Twitter, X, X Twitter, X, however you want to call it. I think those frustrations are really difficult, but if you start to play the game, you don't rely heavily on it, you diversify, you look at other revenue streams, you look at other ways to engage with an audience. So if something does, an algorithm suddenly does change and changes against you, A, you've built up other opportunities and ways to reach at that same audience, but also, you're able um, to be quite agile and not be overly dependent on a certain stratagem which has you know, manpower and everything else linked to it. And then suddenly you're doing what we saw in the 20 teens. And obviously, you know, even within the last kind of 10 months, we've seen absurd change. So for me, it, it's always thinking, this is great, but what if this goes tomorrow? Have I got other options? And at the independent, we are working very hard on those other options and we are seeing those paying off. But it, it's never putting all your eggs in one basket. Okay. And finally, Anna. I know, I, know um, I mean, like, looking at the, uh, the rankings that Press Gazette publishes, you know, Reach has really um, been stung by sort of Facebook changing the way um, it treats news over the last year. So what, what are your thoughts about this? Well, thinking from my perspective, my role over the last year has been how we try to attract under 35 audiences. That's very key for us looking at how we go forward. How are we making sure that we really know younger audiences and we're starting to diversify? I think the point about diversifying and also agility is absolutely key. We have to be able to move between where our different audiences are. And what we've learned over the last year, while well, we've been launched our Reach Under 35s project and our new platforms, um, including Curiously, which is what I'm involved in, is about how we can make sure that we are changing up what we're delivering and how we're delivering it. 
how we're making sure that we're keeping up with the changes around formats, how we make sure that we're delivering content that is different for different platforms, and how we can make sure that we're not just focusing on topics that we knew were working a year ago, two years ago, but that we're moving with the sense of change of social conversation um, and making sure that we've got that sort of diversified topic um, uh, that we can go after rather than just one sort of set of news or traditional type of covering. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Anna. Look, we've got some questions coming in to keep those, keep those coming. Um, I think that one of the big um, themes that's come up this year, and, and I, um, I know we're going to uh, talk about it um, later on. I'm not sure Nick Newman, uh, the Reuters Bureau, is doing a presentation later on. I'm sure he'll talk about this. But one, one of the themes is that people are going to social for their news, uh, and the, but not going to publish your sites. Uh, and a, a, if you look at sort of Gen Z, um, this is really much where they get their news from. They see they, they go to social, um, and they they would they wouldn't really think of going to a publisher site. A, a lot of them, which is obviously if they if that continues, um, that's a little bit worrying. <laughs> um, and I think that uh, so. What 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 do you think? Uh, well, I'll let you lead on this, Matt. How do you get people off social and onto your publisher site, presuming that's uh, the the aim of the game, which I guess it is. Well, I mean, firstly, I'm obviously not going to say our secret sauce, but um, in the way that that I think uh, broadly we can we we look at it is, I think as Mickey said, it, it, it's branding. You've got to give um, stuff that people want. So um, we, you know, we have short clips of uh, podcasts like Millennial Love. Those sort of clips are really quite catchy we've got branding on them you then look at um other ways that we can engage people on that platform and not even attempting to move them off i think sometimes the urge is to be like we want them on our website let's let's bring them to the website all the time all the time all the time and people ignore you you've got to engage them where they are and then within that you then do disperse you know we've got really strong newsletters to try and get them involved in that or we're going to do AMAs on site, but discussing content which is off, uh, tease documentaries we're doing, and then we're, we're looking to, peep, to, to build up an image, build up a brand on that platform, and then from that, you can then start bringing numbers off. And because the numbers are still huge, because it is a social age, the social numbers are big, you just have to accept that you're not going to collect all of them, but there's still huge numbers that we can bring revenue off and we can, we can work with and we can engage and with a high level of engagement um, with the people that we can bring off site. And you look at Instagram, for example, you know, the, the journey off site is rubbish. It's really annoying, but you can get engaged audiences off it. You just have to do it right. And that's the key thing. I'll go to you next on that one, And I mean, do you think um, Gen Z are ever going to go off social media and onto our sites? And, 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 and how are you kind of going about, um, you know, making that, that happen, hopefully? So we're in a slightly different position with some of... So our new brand, Curiously, started as a social content brand. We have only worked on social for a year and only now are we coming to a very early stages of the website. Um, that was really intentional because we wanted to make sure that we were connecting with audiences where they were. We wanted to make sure that we were learning across that year about how different, how the different platforms behave, but also what our different audiences wanted on those platforms and make sure that we were building a community and more importantly, I guess, a brand that they wanted to come back to rather than worrying about them coming onto a site. Now, that's obviously, you know, we are part of a larger organisation, so we have the ability to be able to experiment in pockets, so we are very lucky in that regard. But it has meant that we've been able to really use that year to get to know the data. We're very data-driven. We're um, constantly reviewing the things that are working on different platforms, platforms specifically, to make sure that we can continue that growth. And so really our focus has been on how do we create a community where they are rather than bringing them somewhere else at the moment. The rest of the project, the project isn't just about new, um, new, new products and new um, social brands. It's also about 
looking at our existing brands within reach of obviously which have many regional and national brands and thinking about how we can leverage um, sort of different social experiences to bring people back to site and we have seen that correlation you know we've been working with some of the bigger brands um, Manchester Evening News, Liverpool Echo um, starting on our regional side of the business and building up um, different uh, social offerings we have seen that that has correlated into bringing people onto track onto site because we are building brand awareness people are getting to know the site that maybe weren't aware of those titles before or didn't see them on tiktok or hadn't seen them on instagram so i think it's about creating a balance being where they are and having a valued community on social but also then finding a way to give them extra value which is on site or different products and, and tim i mean you, you you alluded in the intro you said that your traffic from facebook is going up is it or, or is that from all from yeah. Um, so, how are you doing that? Because no one else is managing it. <laughs> uh, there's not the science to it. I won't necessarily get to that at the time. Um, <laughs> it's very simple to what you just said. We'll, we'll just follow where the, where the audience is. We'll follow rather than find it. And one thing that the platforms um, do very well is describe around the culture of relevance. So we often look to what's happening in social and go more deeper than that. So, uh, it remains relevant, it remains culturally up to date, but it's adding a bit more depth to what you might find in the laboratory experience. But ultimately, it's wherever you're going to Okay. And I don't know if you want to weigh in on this one as well, Mickey. Um, yeah, I think I, I would concur with everything that's been said so far. I, this point of understanding where the audience is and what they're most interested in, uh, I think cannot be overstated. The beauty of social is that we can always tell how our content is performing there. So it's really easy to sort of test even without testing. Um, so I think it's important for our publishers to understand what's playing well, what's get, getting the greatest amount of engagement. And I think that begins to give us signals around um, how we can drive traffic to our site and everything else. Okay, but listen, I'm gonna stick with you for the next question. Uh, which is um, around, you know, when we've now we once we've hopefully we've succeeded in getting the the uh, this new reader or, or or returning reader onto our site. Um, what can, what can we do there to make it easier for them to spend more time with our site? I guess that's what we're all trying to do. We want to get them to improve that dwell time from like you know it's quite low, isn't it? For a lot of people, it's two or three minutes. You know. Uh, how, how we get, get them to read more pages and then, you know, hopefully, holy of holies, sort of, uh, you know, take out a subscription and start helping us keep the lights on. Right. So I, I think it's important to understand that whatever friction we introduce to our site, whatever, whatever we introduce to that experience really trains the audience subconsciously or consciously. So whatever experience someone has when they come to your site once or twice, that begins, that, that's locked in their mind about the experience they're going to have every single time they come to your site. So always being conscious of what it is that we're training our audience to know and think about our site when they're coming there, I think is an, is an important factor. It's also really important to understand that whatever decisions we make around that experience, we can't be married to forever. So the, the decisions and the strategy that we came up with today, based on the news cycle, based on, you know, sort of what's, what's happening, may or may not be the right decision six months from now. So I think it's really, really important to be constantly reevaluating that and constantly making decisions about what that customer journey is, what that audience sort of experience and journey is, really on an iterative basis. And third, I think it's important to really understand what is the value exchange? So when we are bringing someone to our site, if we are introducing friction, whether it's a paywall, a registration wall, some sort of an offer, whatever that is, what is the value exchange that we're giving them? Because we, we really do have to understand that however, whatever we're giving to the audience is going to be how they perceive the value of our site and our experience to their reading experience. And I think that we can learn a lot from the social platforms around this, right? So when it, there's a reason why, you know, my 17-year-old might spend 15, 20, 30 minutes at a time 
to much to my chagrin um, on TikTok because there's something about that experience that it's taking him from one experience or one bit of information to another. How are we doing that on our sites as we're thinking about recirculation and everything else related to the journey once someone reaches us? So I think that we've got to be constantly really intentional about what that is and understanding how we're training our audiences as they're coming to us. And so does that mean um, trying to be quite sort of clever in the, the content that you suggest to them once they've read one thing? Uh, making sure you give them something tailored to them next. Is that something we can do? I, I think that the recirculation module, suggestion modules is really, really important here. There's a reason why, you know, we all know the brands that do this best, right? You go for one video and here you are in the rabbit hole 25 minutes later. Uh, so yes, I, I do think that that's incredibly important. Okay. Um, yeah, so, same, same question to, um, to you, Matt. So what, what do you, what, 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 how are you looking at things once you've got people onto the site? How do you, how do you encourage them to stick around and, and, and I guess register? That, that's the big thing, isn't it? Well, I, I think, you know, we've got a mixed model of, you know, free access content. We have premium content. And what I'm always thinking of, and I think most of us do, which is what is their journey? So, you know, we can talk time on page. We, obviously, everyone wants that to be higher than it is. Uh, we want to see completion um, of videos. You know, we all want that. But what I really want to do is I want to see that they are going through, you know, two, three uh, articles. Now, at what point do we do, do we get them suggested to say a premium content? You know, that's a question, and that's something you need to test out, and you need to have um, the data analytics to be able to play with that. And I think that's. That's something that we're all doing. And I think that you've really got to avoid dogma. I think in any organization, news organization, especially legacy ones, you have a situation where people go, well, we, you know, that's how it works. Well, the comedy is, is that someone's saying that's how it worked in 2015. And you're like, well, that is eons ago. And I think, yes, social tells how to do things. There are ways that you can just do subtle shifts and we've seen this at The Independent, um, where subtle shifts can really see improvements. And, and we're talking recommended links. You know, where do you place them? How do you place them? How are you working your images? Um, how are we presenting them with premium? When are we presenting them with premium? And it all you, you want to be able to map these journeys and tailor it to their entry point. And I think those can get quite complex, but that's... That's where the winds are. And I think if, you, if you're thinking, oh, we don't have a plan for this, the answer is you, you really should. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in on that one or go on to, a, go on to another question. I'll go on to another one. Um, I've, got a lot of, I've got a bunch of questions coming in. Um, I'm going to give you one more from my list, and then I'm going to go through to some, some ones that are coming in on Slido. Um, so I'm going to ask you one about metrics. Sexy subject. Um, we, you know, we, we've all got um, like a bunch of tools nowadays to at our disposal to see what content's doing what. And it's sometimes confusing, I guess, for editors or to understand what the most meaningful metric is to look at. I think we would probably most agree that total page views of a given story might be a bit distracting and might lead, if you just went with that, it might lead you. Uh, down to some th do things that weren't necessary, the best decisions for the business. So, um, just wondering what th what are the key metrics um, that you that you guys look at? Um, um, start with you, Tim. And yeah, so it's a combination of lots of metrics that we're looking at uh, all day long. Uh, for us, the two key ones are views and engagement. Uh, so it, it, it's relevant. Right and um, I think we're getting four and five forwards beginning the year and use a month now. On those two metrics, we very quickly understand in the second particular social environment is whether that piece of content is good enough or not for our audience. So it's an immediate feedback loop. Uh, and we can measure that hourly, minute by minute, and it's dropping down to some due to our output or something in the algorithm. So just those two metrics alone. 
Um, and then I've just been solving all the today, and I've just been solving the changes in the algorithm. Uh, it's all on Instagram and all that. Okay. Anna, what do, what, do you, what do you guys look at at Reach? Yeah, well, I mean, Reach overall, um, we have a host of different metrics that we're looking at. We are looking at page views. Um, we're looking at engagement. When we look at the under 35s projects, it's been a little bit of a, a different approach for us because it's more about building audiences from scratch. So we're thinking particularly around social engagement, as, um, as Tim said, looking at views and engagements, but then also you know, learning more about things like watch time, how important that is for us in terms of returning um, users and also um, the distribution of that content around the rest of the algorithms. I think engagement is really important for us and there is a, there's a, con a misconception that page use is the metric that is looked at um, only. I, you know, all of our editors look at a suite of metrics every day, not only just for you know, the overall site, but drilling down into the detail of each individual topic or department or um, section of the site. So engagement is huge for us. Page view also still really important. Okay. What, 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 about, uh, what about the independent, Matt? Um, I mean, there's a whole suite. Yes, you know, page views and um, time on page or completion rate when we're talking about videos, these are key. But again, I think just to reiterate what I, I was kind of hinting at earlier is, is where they're going next. Like where's the drop off off that article? If we're looking at just a typical online article, where's the drop off, where are they going next? Are they just going back to the home page, Or are they going to a particular recommended link on that type of article? Why are they doing that? And then we can kind of delve into that and we can build plans around that. Or, you know, we rearrange the stratagem on how we structure that type of article. Um, so, yes, page views, yes, you know, when you're talking about Google share of voice, all these things matter and you should be using them and, and cultivating and um, things and reselling and doing all sorts of games that all of us do. But in addition, look at, at that kind of on-site engagement and just see how we can, how we can move the journey on-site. Because okay. once you've got them there, it's criminal just to let them go. Okay, criminal. <laughs> uh, Mickey, metrics. What do you what, what do you what, what do you look at? So of course varies across a number of different ARC XP clients, but I would say that you know frequency, duration, and then um, you know sort of uh, pages per visit, right? Like we yeah. want to ensure that people are. If you're in a number of different verticals, which obviously many of our, our customers are, we want to make sure that you know which of those verticals are, are, are really hitting, what, what are people most interested in? And then I'm sort of speaking from ARCXP clients and then also the Washington Post, I would say frequency, duration, and number of sections visited. Okay. Listen, I've got, got a bunch of questions coming in, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna read some of these out and see, see who wants to jump in on these. This is, a, this is an interesting one. So, do you see social teams uh, growing or shrinking uh, with the introduction of Gen AI. So I think that's a question asking whether maybe some of um, some of the work we do now uh, in terms of ta uh, tailoring content for Twitter or different platforms might might be done by a sort of um, a, a sort of digital assistant in future. Who don't know who wants to chip in on that? Can I, can yeah? I jump in on that first? Yeah. I think. I mean, there are lots of products which use, um, you know, they use machine learning to help uh, social media editors. Um, you know, this is a story that should do well for you on this platform. And I think we know the platforms we're talking about, um, the tools we're talking about, and they can be very useful. Um, but I think the, the nature of, um, of, of kind of platforms, especially things like TikTok, especially um, you know, stuff, a lot of stuff that the Lad Bible does, I would argue would be really hard to see the success from an AI perspective. I cannot see that being replicated. Now that might, in a year's time, please do not quote this back to me, <laughs> but that is my current reading of it. I think there's more nuance now for us in how we work with these platforms and work on them and be dynamic that I just don't think AI is there yet 
to give us that kind of tailored sell. And I think the sell is so important. And if we're not, and I, I think there's an element where this has worked five times before, let's do it again. Well, that's a better fallacy. It's, that's not how it works. You've really got to be ready for things to subtly change and you to change with it. Okay. I think it's, I think it, the, the question goes to the system. I think it's a useful system. Um, but it doesn't, there are certain things it doesn't do well currently, it couldn't do well in the future, possibly. So, some of the human taste. Uh, it's not doing that particularly well, but the sum of the humor is important to put back in my car. So I think we're learning from it. I mean, even some of the, if you look at how we have to be on the platform, the lot of related tools exist in TikTok, so like now AI generated tools. And consumers like them and engage with them, you know, the AI voices and so on, uh, are native, and um, they want to like to AI voices. So it plays as well, but in, in a sort of consistent style of way. If anyone else wants to chip in on that one, we move on to another question. Okay. Um, here's a question about metrics. Why don't you use revenue per session as your key metric? Um, I don't know whether that, that sounds like it's hard to do, but <laughs> does anyone have a, Mickey? Yeah, I would say that would be particularly tough to do. So I, I one of the things I may not have shared in the beginning. So I'm a marketer at heart. And so one of the things that I talked about was the importance of social with respect to marketing and branding. I think that's really tough to measure from a revenue per session standpoint. I mean, obviously we have ways of uh, measuring marketing impact, but I think that that's a, that's a tougher one uh, to do. Not impossible. Uh, it's certainly easier to do on site, right? Like we can, uh, obviously we, from a CPM standpoint, we can get there. But I think when we start to talk about uh, impact on social, it is, it is tougher to do from a revenue standpoint. It goes back to the conversation that we were having around the, some of the difficulties around still getting to a monetization um, model on social social for, for many publishers, I think. Okay. Um, how, this is a good one, a uh, big, big, uh, big theme this. How do we tackle news avoidance, um, especially in younger audiences? That's from Sally Nolan. Hi, Sally. Thanks for, uh, oh, there she is. Hi, Sally. Thanks for, thanks for that. How, how do we tackle news avoidance, particularly in younger people? So this is a big theme, isn't it? A lot, there's a big bunch of people who just don't want to know. <laughs> what do we do about that? Yeah, we can take this one. Um, well, I think the first thing we need to do is to break that down into what news actually means for you, younger audiences. I think there's a, there is a kind of a thinking that traditional news is, is the thing that younger audiences are moving away from. But from everything that we've learned through our data and also through talking to the team, our team is um, made up of people between 19 and 35 and are obviously regularly consuming in the way that Gen Z and millennials are, um, is that they actually see news in a slightly different way, but it might be around slightly different topics. It's just not, not interpreted in the same way as we might see news um, a, a, a tradition. Um, if you look at the things that work well for us, a lot of them actually do come within topics that we would cover. Health, for example, is something that we've seen come through quite strongly. Fitness and well-being, um, lots of entertainment news and celebrity news are actually things that are covered within the traditional news agenda. But I think where we look at what is what we're defining as news, that's where we may become um, to the issue of news, news avoidance. We know that there is an, uh, a deliberate amount of news of audience amongst younger audiences who want to see things framed slightly differently. But I think that's about us getting to know the audiences, knowing what they want and actually listening. We did, as part of our project, we've done an awful lot of user research to try and figure out what is it about news that younger audiences don't actually want to consume. And some of it is around the nature of how it is positioned. Some of it is about the kind of tone of the way that news often comes across so for us it's about how do we take that and try to create content that um, appeals to them in a slightly different way one example of that is kind of the explainer that's just been much sort of trialed as something that's working for um, gen z but the core of that really is about breaking down topics and giving them in a way that is engaging um, because of the way that they're consuming 
um, any content on social. It's much more about the fact that they want to have things in a quick and easy to um, digest format rather than something that is about the actual subject itself in, in what we found. So we've really started to try and think about how do we get to know those topics in much more detail? How are we looking at specifically the um, stories that are being read by 18 to 35s every day? in conference every day, who is looking and talking about those younger audiences and what we should be delivering for them. And that, I think, is how we get to a point where we actually have an understanding of what is at the core of the news avoidance issue. OK. Yeah, so maybe maybe news maybe they're avoiding the news we're doing doesn't necessarily mean they're, <laughs> they're, they're avoiding news all across the board. And yeah. we see a lot of engagement in topics around um, politics. We can still get quite a lot of engagement around those topics, looking at world news, more global news. We are seeing those still coming through. Um, but also it's about then what, how can we really say that each of our news agendas each day is tailored towards the younger audience of the biggest story of the day? What's the 18 to 35? Or, you know, that's a really broad um, demographic. Within that, how do we break it down and make sure that we're showing viewpoints that actually reflect that audience and are relevant to them? If we take the biggest story of the day, are we looking at it from a um, sort of populist perspective? Or are we actually breaking it down and figuring out how does that affect a 20 year old or a 25 year old or 30 year old? Okay. Um, I've got a, a B2B question. I don't know if anyone wants to answer a B2B question, but it's about the value of um, LinkedIn for growing, uh, for, for growing audiences and growing subscriptions. Anyone want to chip in on that, LinkedIn? Um, I think it's LinkedIn is one of those networks which I think LinkedIn itself would like to be seen as more of a new source. And I think there is growth potential there. There is an ability to grow subscriptions in there. I mean, it is a it is a uh, an environment where you will have consumers who have or um, who have the disposable income to look at subscriptions. If that's something you're doing, I think you have to approach it in the right way, and you have to be producing and promoting the right stuff. But it's definitely an opportunity place, and I think if people aren't thinking about it, they should be thinking about it. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a that's an easy quick take of yes. Do 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 have a look at it. Okay. And I want to just add to that, we can't be uh, platform agnostic when it comes to the content that um, we're thinking about for all social platforms. So what will play well on LinkedIn won't necessarily play as well uh, on Instagram uh, for, for, for a variety of reasons. And I think that uh, tailoring the content for the audience on each platform and why people are coming to LinkedIn. Uh, it may be that um, certain content around wellness would actually play really well on LinkedIn. It may be that certain content around uh, environment would play really well on uh, in Instagram. So I really do think that it's really about tailoring the content for the platform or I shouldn't say tailoring the content, selecting the content appropriately for the platform. Okay. We've only got a couple of minutes left. We've got a bunch of uh, questions still to go through, so we might have to let people buttonhole you in the, um, in the drinks break, if that's all right, for, for, for extra questions. Um, just, to, just to sort of close, it'd be great um, and if, you've got it, if you've got it left, just to give everyone like sort of one tip, if you like, or one, or one take home. If you're, if you're an audience growth, uh, manager or somebody who's, you've probably had quite a tough year this year, I reckon, wherever you're working, because um, traffic's been going down uh, from, from a lot of different sources, and uh, it's not, 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 no longer easy to grow traffic in the way we used to. So what would be your, um, your tips for people looking to, looking to grow their audience in a meaningful way? Uh, I'll let you go first, Tim, just a quick one. Um, I think, I think a lot of it is decision. Building on your point, um, each platform or the phones or the social platforms have uh, so many nuances. Um, so it's really understanding those nuances in a way that is precise uh, that can add your value. Okay. Who wants to go next on that one? Yeah, on that. Um, I, th I think it's, I think it's, it's the thing to take away from it is just to roll with it. A lot of the time, there's, there's a, and I think Tim mentioned it. Like, don't fight it. 
don't just be like, I just want more from this. Where is it all gone? And it, it can be surprisingly difficult to get people to agree to that. But it's kind of like, right, this type of thing isn't going to work for us. Fine. We need to look at alternative things that do work. And we need to be really quick about it. And we have to enjoy experimenting and have some fun with it. And also look at other platforms and see, is that going to work? And what works on that? And we've got a diversified staff. They can, they've got different fields that could work on different platforms. Health, fitness, these things really do work. You know, get them to tailor that content for okay. a certain platform. Thanks, Matt. Mickey? I would say in the spirit of the three box solution, don't be afraid to revisit strategy often. What worked for you nine months ago could be ancient strategy today. So constantly revisiting strategy and making sure that this decision that you're making today is not just a default to the decision that you made yesterday. Okay, thanks. And Anna? Yeah, it would be very similar for me, being agile, but also challenging, challenging ourselves to know, are we doing things differently enough? And one of the things that we were able to do as part of the Curiously project was kind of think about how we could make a newsroom that was slightly different in terms of skills, roles and um, workflow. <clears throat> how are we looking at our own organisations and seeing whether we're making enough change to keep up with the pace of change that we're seeing in social? Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.